Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see that you all made it here. I'm wondering, how many of you shoveled yesterday? Okay. Aren't you glad for soft seats today? <laughs> kind of sit back, take it easy. Well, I'm glad to see that you guys made it in. It could have been a whole lot worse. Um, I want to thank all of you that are tuning in from far, far away. I hope uh, the Lord blesses you as you stay comfortable in your homes. And for those of us that are here, we get to have fellowship and we have food afterwards. I understand we have hot dogs on the menu, so... <laughs> Get your recommended daily allowance of nitrates. <laughs> well, before we get started, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the beauty of the fresh fallen snow. Thank you, Lord, for the strength and ability that you give to us to be able to handle it still. And Lord, I thank you for those that are here, for those who are tuning in. Lord, we so need you to speak to our hearts today. like honey on our lips, like a lamp to our path, like water to our soul. Lord, we need you. So Lord, as we look into your word, I pray that it might be fresh to us all over again, that we might see you for who you are and might see your incredible love for us. Help us, Lord, to be adjusted, to be like you, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we are in chapter 15 of the book of Luke. Um, Going to go through the whole chapter, all 32 verses. Jesus is responding to the Pharisees and the and the the religious rulers with three parables. It's actually one parable in three stories, and so you're probably familiar with all of them. I'm calling them the lost parables of Jesus, just because it sounds mystical but it's about lost things. First, there's a story about a lost sheep. Then there's a story about a lost coin. And then there's a story of a lost son. And so we're going to look at all three of them here together in the book of Luke. Last week, we saw dinner of the disciples. We saw Jesus speaking about this great feast that's going to happen when he takes us home to be with him, either individually upon our death or upon the rapture. And he also explained to them what it means to be a disciple. Most people, if you were to stop them on the street and say, do you believe you're going to heaven? Most people would say yes. And then if you ask them why, that's where it gets a little crazy. They'll probably tell you something like, well, I'm not a bad person. I've never murdered anyone. Now, of course, it depends on who you get a hold of. But I'm, I'm a good person. I really haven't killed anyone. I haven't done anything really bad. And I try to be a good person as best as I can, which you know is just a lie. Don't you? Don't you know that's a lie? Because nobody is as good as they could be. Could you do have, could you have done better this morning? I know I could have. I look at my walkway and say, I could have done a better job of shoveling than that. You know, I, I look at my car and say, I could have done a better job of clearing that off so it didn't freeze overnight. I, I think of all these things that I could have done better. And, you know, I really don't do my best in every area, do I? And even morally, you know, on the interior of my heart and my mind, I do things that I shouldn't. Well, Jesus goes in to explain to this wonderful dinner that he's having with all of these religious rulers about what it is to be a disciple. He turns then to the crowd and he explains, unless you hate your mother and father and your your wife and your sister and your brother, unless you do that for my sake, you cannot be my disciple. And unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And Jesus just goes on and on and on about how hard it is to follow him and how he requires every bit of us our heart, our our mind, our strength, every activity, everything we look at, everything we listen to, every word we speak, that it's his and he's deserving of it. And it says that the common people gathered around him. And I find that interesting because Jesus said some of the hardest things that he could have said about being a follower and all of the sinners were gathered to him. 
They were attracted by that. They knew that that's what God deserves. And they knew that they didn't measure up. But the religious rulers were offended by what Jesus taught. I just find that very interesting. So we're going to look this week at the lost things. In Luke 15, 32, the father about the prodigal son says, it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So we're going to see these three parables. One is about one sheep in a hundred. The next is about one coin in 10. And the next is about one son in two. And so there are, that's how it's broken down. And it's just really interesting to me. Last week, I neglected to mention this verse, so I'm going to throw it in quickly. Verse 34 in chapter 14 says, salt is good, Jesus says. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is on the tail end of Jesus explaining what it is to be a disciple. And he's saying, you guys are salt, like salt. Now what happens when salt loses its flavor? How do you make it salty? You need salt to make it salty, and then the salt you just salted it with isn't salty anymore. It, it, it's kind of an interesting concept. I don't know if you know where a lot of your salt comes from. I found out a lot about salt. Himalayan sea salt actually is made in India. And you know why it's pink? Because they use seeds to process it, and the seeds actually add the pink to it. I thought it was minerals in the ground. The, so I didn't know. What do I know? But this is, uh, this is some sea salt actually being excavated. They wait for the top layer to dry. They scrape it up and put it into containers and send it here to the United States, and we spend big money on these things that people are walking on their bare feet in. It's amazing. Anyway... Salt is an interesting thing. He likens us unto salt. Salt, by the way, that's the uh, sodium chloride, which it's 60% um, sodium and 40% chloride. You don't care. <laughs> One of the things that salt did, and certainly before we had refrigerators, it preserves. And so if you would go fishing or anything, you would put it on salt, and you would salt this thing, and what it would do, it would stop the bacterial growth. And so it preserves is one thing that salt does. The other thing is it enhances flavor. If you put salt in something that has sugar in it, you need less sugar to make it sweet because it works together. None of you care. Okay. <laughs> salt cleanses your body. Like when you sweat or when you cry or when you have the Omicron virus. All of that is salty stuff, and, and, and you understand what I'm talking about. It cleanses the body, and so your body actually has need of salt. It kills bacteria. One of the first things they used to do when a baby was born is they would rub salt all over the baby. Now you might think it's a preparation for some strange recipe, but what it does is it kills bacteria, and it stops anything that might be growing on the skin. So it kills bacteria. It's in every single cell of your body. That's how important salt is to your body. Of course, um, some of us put salt on top of our salt, and so you got to take it easy because you can get high blood pressure, <clears throat> other things. It flushes out impurities and toxins out of our body. It also kills weeds. If you take it and you mix it with vinegar and you spray it on your weeds, it kills your weeds, and it's biodegradable, and it, none of you care. <laughs> Once it was a salary for soldiers. If you remember, there's a term, uh, old people like us, like, you know, somebody's worth their salt. And salt actually became the word salary. Salt is the root word of salary. There's something you care about. Okay. <laughs> That's actually where the word salary came from. It came from salt. So salt's an interesting thing. And Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth. You are that which brings flavor, preservative, kills bacteria. You're, you're, you are that element that kills weeds. You are the salt of the earth. You are all of those things. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means this is the outcome. This is the function that we have here on the earth. We actually preserve the earth, which is why when the Lord takes us home, it's all just going to go crazy. Moving on to chapter 15. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, 
complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he spoke this parable to them, saying, this entire chapter and, and the next three stories that follow were all prompted by this. This is Jesus' purpose and motive for what he's about to say which I think is important when you're going to listen to something he's going to say. All of the sinners and tax collectors, after hearing about Jesus's high calling, about what it is to be a disciple, gathered around him. But all of the religious elite despised him. I just find that rather amazing. He said, you have to leave everything for me if you're going to follow me. And they were offended by that. And they were offended that these people gathered around Jesus. These guys were the type of people that when they walked through the crowds, they would pull in their robes because they didn't want to brush up against a sinner, maybe be contaminated. They were folks, they were Pharisees who would wear blinders and they would have people led around, lead them around because they didn't want to see any sinners. They felt people were reprehensible. Can you imagine being in ministry and hating people like that? Anyway, so they're just incredibly uh, the most judgmental group that you can possibly think of. And the tax collectors, now I don't know if any of you works for the IRS, but tax collectors back then, basically they were Jews that turned in their heritage, became servants of the Romans so that they could get rich. And they taxed their own people, the Jews. And they were usually pretty devious about it to get rich. And so they were kind of hated people. And sinners, it's interesting. Uh, I imagine everyone's a sinner, don't you? Yes. Except that was a special group of people that the Pharisees used and the scribes. And so they were despising Jesus because he spent time with these people. Can you imagine? Remember, he was invited to the house of a Pharisee and he had a meal with them. And they tried to trap him by putting a guy with dropsy right in front of them in the previous chapter. And yet, they're despising him for eating with sinners. I just find that really sad. It was a common thing for people to be sent away from Jesus or, or be offended at who Jesus spent time with. We see in Luke chapter 9, it says, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him what they, all that they had done. And he took them and he went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city of Bethesda. He took them aside to kind of have them talk about all the things that they once did, if you remember that. But the multitudes knew it and they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And he healed those who had need of healing. So Jesus said, okay, guys, let's pull aside. Let's go to the, the house of, you know, fish and bread. And, you know, we're going to sit down and, and have a meal. And in the midst, this whole crowd gathered around Jesus and he starts healing them and teaching them. And the disciples are like, I thought we were off to lunch. What's going on here? And they got frustrated. Verse 12, when the day began to wear away, the 12 came and said to him, send the multitudes away that they may go to the surrounding towns and country and lodge there and get provisions for we're in a deserted place here. So you see, even the disciples didn't want the people around. They kind of wanted Jesus to themselves. And they had this promise of going out with Jesus and kind of being able to discuss all the things that they did. If you remember, they were sent out two by two and there were miracles that were done. And it was the first time that they were actually sent out to do that. And they wanted to kind of break it all down for Jesus except the crowd showed up and they wanted to shoo him away. There was a time when children came up to Jesus and the women brought the children to be blessed by Jesus that he might pray over them. And the disciples said, go, go away. Don't bother the teacher. He's too busy for you. And Jesus said, what? Let the little children come to me because such is the kingdom of heaven. You see people that just send people away from Jesus. I hope, I hope we, but either by our actions or by our words, never do that. I hope we can always bring people to Jesus. And I hope your schedule is not so packed that you don't have a moment to answer a question to some poor sinner that you wouldn't stop everything you had and find them to be valuable enough to spend some time with. Amen. So this is a single story that Jesus is going to tell after here in three parts. You're going to see seekers on one side, a shepherd, a woman, and a father. You're going to see the lost on the other side, a sheep, a coin, 
and two sons. I will assert there are two sons that are lost in this story. The key words that you're going to see in all of this is lose, seek, find, and rejoice. In all three of these stories, you're going to find lose, seek, find, and rejoice. So you can look for those verbs. I feel like I'm in school. These teachings of Jesus were birthed in conflict and bitterness by those around him. How do you think you'd handle this? Imagine a bunch of people say, so where do you go to church? Well, I go to Grace Bible Fellowship. Those people? I see motorcycles parked out there. Four-wheel drive vehicles. <laughs> rally boxes. You know, like all kinds of things. I mean, what kind of people do you think are in there? I wonder. How would you respond to somebody like that? Jesus responds like that with three parables. The deepest, richest stories that you will find anywhere, anywhere in literature. And the parable of the, the lost son or the prodigal son, you may know it as, is probably the highest. And so we're going to get into this. And this is how Jesus handles it. So the first one is the shepherd and the lost sheep. In verse 3, he says, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one in which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep which was lost. It just sounds like such a really nice story. Unless you begin to start taking it apart. And you say, okay, so you've got a hundred sheep. And you count them and you discover one's gone. And sheep are some of the stupidest animals in the whole world. You can call a sheep and it will bolt. It will go in the opposite direction. It will run away from you. I happen to go to a place where I get my firewood and it was a guy that said, uh, yeah, you got to get out into the field because he's out again. I said, you need some help? He goes, yeah, sure. You want to come with me? Ran across the field o over clods of dirt and all this stuff. And there's this sheep, bah, 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 <laughs> stuck in the fence, <laughs> trying to get out. Like, there's nothing on the other side of the fence you want. Your food, your everything is here. Why are you going there? Bolted. Went over there, had to untie the wire and all that kind of thing, finally get him out, and, and he bolted for the opposite corner, <laughs> trying to find another exit. <laughs> Stupid animals. <laughs> By the way, Jesus calls us sheep. <laughs> no visible means of defense, really. Teeth are totally flat, so, you know, if you get a little piece of skin in there, it might hurt, but it's not like a, you know, a canine. So... You lose a sheep, okay, I don't know about you, but if I've got 100 sheep and I lose one, I'm like, sucks to be you, sheep. You're on your own. Right? Jesus said, no. You have 100 sheep, you leave 99 where? In the wilderness. He didn't say in a cage. He didn't say in a pendant area. He didn't say at home. He said in the wilderness. You leave a hundred in the wilderness on the outside, exposed. Interesting story, Jesus, that suddenly takes a turn. And you go and you find one. And when you find him, you put him on your shoulders. And you carry him because you know he's going to bolt again. <laughs> but you're so excited that you found the sheep. He could have gotten hit by a car. I mean, anything could happen. You found your sheep, and so you're going to put him on your shoulders and carry him home. It's this wonderful story. And when he gets home, he doesn't go back to the other sheep, the 99. He goes home with one sheep, and he's ecstatic that he found one sheep. He left in the morning with 100, came back with one, and he's thrilled. Do you understand how ridiculous the story is? It's like, hey, I crashed into a pole, but
But then all of a sudden, my wallet from 17 years ago slid out from underneath the seat. And I said, oh, there it is. <laughs> Look, here's my old license. Here's an old picture of my wife. Look at all these wonderful things. <laughs> Look, I found my wallet. You just crashed your car, dude. <laughs> That's kind of what the story is. Do you see that? This isn't the feel-good Sunday school moment that maybe you thought it would be. And Jesus said, this is what God's like. This is what God's like. You want to know who God is and what he's like? This is the kind of love he has for the lost. Not the 99. For the lost. And who's he saying this to? The Pharisees who are beating him up for spending time with sinners and tax collectors who gladly heard him. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Who are the ones who need no repentance? The Pharisees the Sadducees, the lawyers, the scribes, they have no need for repentance. In fact, they have no room for repentance in their life. They're the 99 who will be out in the wilderness and left alone, and they won't make it home. You understand Jesus' point here? It's a little deeper than what you thought. And yes, this looks just like Brett Huntington. I searched far and wide to find Brett as Jesus with a lamb on his shoulders, <laughs> and there he is. In John chapter 10, Jesus tells us this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he was not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep. He sees a wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep, and he flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring that they may hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. By the way, Jesus was talking about you. If you're not a Jew, Jesus was talking about you. Jesus is the good shepherd. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I was once lost and found by Jesus. Amen. So, God loves the lost. The Pharisees didn't. God seeks the lost. The Pharisees avoided them. And God rejoices in their rescue. So should we. We should be in the business of that. 1 Timothy 2.4 tells us about God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the desire, the heart, of the good shepherd is to seek and save that which is lost. And aren't you glad that you serve that God? Amen. And he's the one who finds you. Notice the sheep doesn't have a capability of finding the shepherd. The shepherd has to find the sheep. The best we could do is just stick around. Because very often what a shepherd would do is if he found that there was an animal that would stray all the time, a sheep, he would break its legs, which seems cruel and unusual. And he would carry it on his shoulders all the time. And it became a pet. And because the animal couldn't get up on his four legs and run away anymore, he became very attached to the shepherd. And once those legs were healed, he would never leave. Aww. He would be right there next to the shepherd because he's developed a relationship. I just hope you don't need your legs broken. I can tell you I've, I've had something similar to that. But I thank God that his desire is for me to be saved. The second story is about a woman and a lost coin. Verse 8, 
Or what woman having 10 coins or 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So you see, there's the lost, the seeking, the found, and the rejoicing. In the same, same fashion, Jesus tells the story. Now, you and I might not understand, you know, if you lost a quarter, that might, or a 50 cent piece, or a silver dollar, maybe that'd be a big deal. But see, you're talking about a special kind of a silver coin. It's actually a month's wage. And it would be part of a headdress that the woman would be given when she gets married. And it would be worn on her head. It'd be a necklace that's worn on her head. It would have 10 of these coins. And so each one was worth a lot of money. And it was a sign that you were married. So it's, it's like having a wedding ring if you were to lose a wedding ring somewhere. So this woman is scouring her house and cleaning like she's never cleaned before uh, in a place that probably either had stone or dirt floors looking for one of these coins because it was part of this headdress that she would wear. So it was much more than just a silver coin. It was a sign that she was married and keeping that up and showing it was saying that she valued her marriage relationship. And if it got ratty looking, that would say something about the way she views her marriage or the way she views her husband. And so it might cause some conversation if there were some missing coins. Yeah, yeah, I lost them years ago. Yeah. Hey, that's a nice wedding ring. Yeah, I lost the stone a long time ago, but yeah, I still wear it. It's a good, good way to open mail, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it would be like that. But it would also be something that she would have, something of value that she would have all the time in case she was suddenly widowed. They don't typically inherit from the husband when they die they would have to be taken care of, but they would have some finances. So it was a bit like insurance as well. So this silver coin that she's talking about is a little bit more than just losing, you know, a 50 cent piece in your house. But she sweeps it clean, lights a lamp and looks as diligently as she can and she finds it. I found it. So what she does is she reattaches it to her headdress. She puts it on. And then she spends $50 on Dunkin' Donuts and has all her friends over and has coffee and says, rejoice with me because I found the coin that I lost. It sounds as ridiculous as the previous story. You found a coin, you blew a ton of cash and had a party because you found it. Why don't you clean your house more often? Why don't you know where your keys and your cell phone are? What's, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting off. <laughs> This is the way God feels about a sinner that repents. It's like finding a lost coin. That's how God feels about the lost. And Jesus is saying this in the presence of those who have no use, and they even deride Jesus for spending time with sinners and publicans. The third story you're all very familiar with is about a father and a son. It's called the prodigal son. And even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard of the prodigal son. Um, some very famous authors believe it is the finest work of literature that there is. And Jesus shoots off the cuff and just tells this story because these guys were all sour about the people Jesus spent time with. I find it incredibly proving that this is not just a man. This is the son of God. Amen. Verse 11, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, if you were a Jew listening to this, you would be incensed at this point. Having an older and a younger son and your son, younger son says, listen, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead and I had my inheritance now so I could spend it on whatever I want. And it says that the father divided it up and paid him. What would you say to a son who said, listen, dad, I wish you were dead and I had the inheritance. 
you know, that which is going to be mine when you're dead, because I could use it now while I'm alive. I think that would be better. Can you imagine? I don't know how old this kid was, but I, I would be steaming. Wouldn't you? You, you what? You want my what? You get out. There's the door. Get out. Get, go. I'll let you know when I'm dead, okay? Or someone else will. Right? Would that not be your response? Or at least your automatic intention? You're done. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to support you. Get out from under my roof. Who do you think I am? You wish I were dead. I always love it. Children. He says, give me. Father, give me. Give me. Not please. Not I wish. He wasn't even being passive aggressive like, boy, you know, it'd be nice if I had my inheritance early. You know, he wasn't being passive aggressive. He was just saying, give me my money. What would you do if your son said that to you? Here's 20 bucks. I don't want to see your face anymore. Get out. What would you do if your kid said that? And yet, he probably had to liquidate some assets, and he turns it into cash, and he pays him. These are three ridiculous stories, guys. Do you understand? These aren't cushy Sunday school stories. Jesus is trying to shock the crowd. This younger son trades his inheritance that he would get later for a cash out option now. I want you to go into early retirement, dad, and die so I can have my money. An unheard of request, and the father pays him. These three stories are about God as our father and how gracious he is. This story is about a gracious father much more than it is about a wayward son. And so he pays him in full view of the older brother. He says, here you go. Runyard Kipling wrote a poem about the prodigal son. And he tries to get inside the head of the prodigal son, who's the younger son. And of course, if you know anything about earth, birth order, there's always this competition. And, you know, the older one tends to be the, the alpha you know, the take control, the get it done person, you know. And in this story, it's no different. And the younger seems to always be in the shadow of the older. And so he says this, my father glooms and advises me. My brother sulks and despises me. My mother catechizes me, that's to teach, till I want to go out and swear. The, the younger son just wants to get the heck out. He doesn't like his relationships with anybody in the house. He doesn't like living in the shadow of the older brother. He just wants to get out and do something awesome. Doesn't know anything about life, apparently. Certainly about earning money. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and he journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So he gathers everything, takes all his stuff because he's not coming back. He's burned that bridge. You get it? Bye. See ya. And he's not coming back. Can you imagine the callousness of a child to do that? I bet some of you are saying yes on the inside. You may actually have a prodigal in your life. And it's not hard to imagine because it might be your very situation. Well, he gathers everything and he begins to spend dad's money. And you know, they must have seen him come a mile away. Here comes a young guy smiling ear to ear with a pocket full of cash. Oh, we're going to befriend him very quickly and make friends with him and show him where he can spend all his money with me. They must have seen him coming a mile away. Prodigal living, by the way, means riotous, extravagant, and wasteful. It means just throwing your money around because it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not worth anything because you didn't earn it, right? Any of you know what I'm talking about? That's what prodigal living is. Just living in a crazy way because money doesn't mean much. He took everything, broke free, went far away and did whatever he wanted. That sounds like the American dream. 
get a pocket full of cash and go to Atlantic City and blow it all on crazy living. Sounds like a great story, but you guys know how it goes. But when he had spent all, that's usually when people wake up, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine eat. And no one gave him anything. So he finds the bottom. When everything runs out, this good Jewish boy is now taking care of unclean animals. There couldn't be anything more degrading for a good Jewish boy who comes from a very wealthy home than to be thrown to feed pigs. And he wanted to eat the food the pigs were eating. Probably wasn't able to because somebody was watching him. And nobody gave him anything. That's a desperate situation. It never lasts. You did not earn it, so you wasted it all. Life is hard away from the Father, and his protection and provision will not follow you to that place. How many of you know that? You step off and you decide you're going to do it on your own. You're on your own. And I'm glad God does not take care of us in that place or we would never leave that place. You will now have to degrade yourself to stay in this faraway land. You are being used because you are unloved. But you do not need to stay here, do you? This young man is not loved by anyone. He's being used. When he was home, he was loved, and he didn't want it. Now he's being used, and that's what he chose. It's a very deep, deep misery to be far from God, and regardless on, how, on what stage you find a young man like this, he may be happy and thrilled, but he hasn't reached the bottom yet. Some people's bottoms are a little further than others. This guy had to hit absolute rock bottom. And the grace of God is him letting us go. Because there are things that we need to learn in that state. Some of us whose head is a little harder than others takes a bit more pounding before yeah. it actually saturates the boneheadedness of someone like myself. But when he came to himself, this is the turn in the story. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise. I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He says, what am I doing? By the way, you have to understand the household of, of a wealthy man in this time. You had your family. You had bond servants. A bond servant is somebody who has pledged their life to you. They have paid off a debt at some point in time and they've been under your care and they decided you are so good to me, I could go nowhere and get treated any better so I will serve you for the rest of my life. What they would do is they would take you, the master would take you to the front door of the house, he would take your earlobe, put it up against the door, take an awl and go Poo! and pop a hole in your ear. They'd pop an earring in your ear and it'd be an indicator that you were possessed by someone and you belonged to a house. That person was treated much like the family, by the way. They were taken in and much like the family. So that's a bond servant. Then you have servants. They usually get hired by the chief bond servant. They're usually overseen and they're taken care of. They might be included in some aspects of the family, but they're not like the bond servant or the rest of the family. 
And then you have hired servants. Hired servants would be hired like a per diem. I'm going to hire you to come and pick all the, you know, apples off my tree. I'm going to hire you to come and cut my lawn. They were hired servants. They had nothing to do with the family. There was no connection. There was no love. There was no anything. There was, you do a job and I pay you, bye-bye. That's what he was saying. Make me like one of your hired servants. He knows he did wrong. He knows that he's not worthy to be called a son any longer. I think of Charlie Brown, good grief. You know, there is such a thing as good grief. When you grieve over your sin, it's the first step in changing. Amen. It's good grief. In fact, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 10 tells us about that. Paul wrote a letter to them and, and asked them to straighten out because they were doing some things wrong. And he says, now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner yeah. that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. For godly sorrow produces yeah. repentance, leading to salvation, yeah. not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. There is a right kind of sorrow. Everyone in jail is sorry, but not everyone in jail will repent. Sorrow can cause repentance, but not unless it's done in a godly way. Amen? Amen? When we look to him to be the provider and the protector. Often hardships will beat us up to wake us up. Any of you had an experience like that? Made a wrong decision, did something you shouldn't have done, and it beat you up? Maybe it involved a court date. Maybe it involved a separation. Maybe it involved a, a firing. Those things that beat you up are usually there to wake us up if, if our skulls are not too thick. It's interesting that he goes from give me in the beginning to make me. He now goes to his father and he says, make me like one of your hired servants. Not give me what is mine when you die right now. Make me. You know, that's a good prayer request right there. Lord, make me like one of your hired servants. Make me somebody who will serve. You see the humility in that. It's not give me, it's make me. Verse 20, and he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. You see, when he finally decided to make a change, he knew where to go. And he got up and he went back to his father. But while he was still a great way off, the father saw him. You know what that tells me? The father was waiting for him. The father looked in the direction in which he went, and he said, that was, that's the last place I saw my son go over the horizon. And there he was watching, waiting, anticipating the return. Because God knows, doesn't he? And he begins with this little speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He's got the speech all, you know, read out and he starts to, to go. But the father sees him a long way off and he runs. I don't know if you've ever seen a middle-aged, somewhat overweight <laughs> man like me run. It's not pretty. But he runs. The father runs. Now, a dignified man would never do this. A rich man would never do this. But the father does because he has compassion on the son. And he knows finally, he's finally reached an end. That's a good place. It says he falls on his neck and he kisses him. 
I don't know about you, but when I, when I act like an idiot and I sin against God, I don't feel like my reunion with him is going to go this well. I feel like I'm going to go to him and he's going to say, what do you want? What? Come on, you're kidding me. You left, you took all my money. You, that's it. You burned the bridges, dude. You're done. Go. I don't want to see you anymore. You're dead to me. That's the way I feel when I sin. I feel like I can't go to God because he's my heavenly father, probably a lot like my earthly father was. And I'm completely wrong. This is how our heavenly father waits for you and I to turn. So when you wake up, you know where to go. The father waits and he watches for you. The father runs to meet you. And he greets you with a love that you do not deserve. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, God will receive you just like this in Christ. Not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it, because you've taken everything he's given you, your life, your breath, your finances, your energy, your thoughts, and you've wasted them. And God the Father waits until you finally say, I'm done. And you come home. By the way, he didn't get to the part where he said, make me like one of your servants because I'm not worthy to be called your son. He didn't get in that little section of speech yet because the father cuts him off. Because whatever he has to say doesn't matter. <laughs> but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The father declares a holiday. It's like Thanksgiving and Christmas all rolled into one. And we're going to have a party because my son was dead. He puts on a robe, a robe that would indicate that he belongs to the father, that he's an accepted son. And he has a place of status in the family. They put a ring on his finger, which would have a family insignia, which means he has the authority of the father. He puts shoes on his feet because apparently he had to get rid of those and sell them off. And so takes care of the basic provisions for him to be able to be taken care of. And then he says, kill the fatted calf because we're going to have a party and we're all going to eat and rejoice that you're home. He gives him honor, a public declaration of honor in every possible way. Do you think the father says, you know, let's have a party now. I'll talk to you later. Because I'm still a little, no. But I'm like that. But the father's not like that at all. Not with this young man and not with us. I see intimacy and joy in this relationship. God wants to be intimate with us and he wants to rejoice over us. And you like me, are unworthy. And yet, God loves us, and he wants to rejoice over us. Note to self. Notice the heart of the Father. I need to remember this. Because when I blow it, my mind gets rolling, and the devil begins to whisper and tell me, that's it, you blew it, buddy. You're done. Any of you have that little voice back of your head? You, what are you going to do now? You're going to repent? Yeah, right, sure. That's the devil. That comes right from the pit of hell. And yet that's not the relationship that God has with us through Christ, is it? Jesus Christ is the one who came so that we could approach the Father, Amen. without which we would have no hope and we would be done. Now, this is where it gets a twist. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Now we've, we've seen the fatted calf here before. What is that? No, it's not that. I should never put up slides. No one pays attention. 
going to kill the fatted calf. <laughs> Killing the fatted calf has nothing to do with that part of your body that's your calf. It's nothing to do with cankles. It's, it's, it's an animal. It's a fatted calf. And I always thought, well, what's this fatted calf thing? Well, by the way, there are sacrifices that happen all the time. And when there is a fellowship offering, there's a sacrifice that's made and portions of it are offered unto God and the other portions of it are eaten. So this is a blood sacrifice. Does it remind you of something? This is a blood sacrifice for reconciliation. As you'll see in the Old Testament, and as Jesus himself was the sacrificial lamb of God for us. There's a sacrifice. There's blood that's spilled, but it's all done in the spirit of intimacy and joy. And Jesus comes and dies for us. He is the fatted calf, the one who's prepared to be the sacrifice for our sin. Speaking of the older son, but he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed any of your commandments or at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours comes, he's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. The son that stayed back, the dutiful son, who did everything he was supposed to do. The guy who now has to do double work because the younger one split with his inheritance. You know he's mumbling all day long. Stinking brother of mine, who's he think he is? Or you got to ask yourself some questions. Where is this older brother? He's on the outside. He's not on the inside. He wouldn't come in. The son and everyone else, including the father, are on the inside. Where's the older brother? He's on the outside. He won't come in. Who's Jesus speaking to? The Pharisees who are on the outside. So what is the older brother's problem, really? What is his problem? He says, I've been perfect. I've been perfect. I've done everything right. Who's that sound like? The religious leaders. We do everything right. We wear all the right clothes. We hang out with only the right kind of people. We only do right and religious things. You see the arrogance? And Jesus is speaking right to them. What is the older brother's attitude towards his father? I've been a good slave to you. I've done everything I can. Wait, let me start patting myself on the back. There's no love. There's no love for his father. He's not serving his father because he loves him. There's no relationship. I'm a slave. Wow. And now this guy comes, and I, I can't even get a goat out of you. Is that true? So what is the attitude towards his younger brother? He has all the fun. He goes out. He gets the money. He goes out and does whatever he wants to do. I can't do that. I have to stay here. I have to be good. Do you understand? He's jealous. It's like me when I'm doing my best to go 65 in the parkway and somebody goes, Whoa. I go, you dirty dog. I could go that fast. You think this little car can't go? That? Pff, forget it. He's jealous. He's jealous because somewhere in his heart, he's just desiring to do all these things, but he's not bold enough to go up against his dad and do it. So he just is obedient. There's no love in this relationship for the father. Who is Jesus speaking to? The religious leaders. You have no love. Out of these two sons, he's the more lost. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. By the way, when you have a younger son and an older son, 
the older always gets a double portion according to the law. And so the younger would get one third of the father's estate. The older would get two thirds of the estate, presumably to take the farm, to take the business and progress and keep the land, which would then be inherited by the next generation. So they would stay in the family. And so the older brother was to be the responsible one who stayed behind and made sure all that happened. And the father, speaking rightly, he says, everything I have is yours because everything left over is his, right? It was right that we should make Mary and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You might remember Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is a similar telling to the parable that Jesus tells. A young girl who's looking to get off the farm. She lives in Kansas. She wants to go out there somewhere over the rainbow where everything's different, where everything's better. She wants to get away from her house and away from the, the humdrum of the, of the farm. And she has no idea. And of course, the house gets picked up by a tornado and dropped up somewhere over the rainbow and she's hallucinating or she's dreaming or it's really happening. And she gets to see what it's like outside the safety of the farm. It's very much like the telling of the prodigal son. I find it interesting what she says at the very end. If I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there, I never really lost it to begin with. Our hearts desire to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the one I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Every one of us has a prodigal son heart, a piece of us. Every one of us has a piece of the older brother's heart. Yeah. Every one of us is like a coin that God scrubbed to find and worked hard to recover. Every one of us is like that lost sheep that gets found. I would hope you're not one of the 99 who feels he doesn't need to repent, who gets left in the wilderness. Remember who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the Pharisees primarily about their hard heartedness, about those who are lost. The key words are lose, seek, find and rejoice. The lost is us. The seeker is God. We get found in Jesus Christ. And there's rejoicing in the presence of God. But not for these guys. They're like the 99 left in the wilderness that had no need to repent. They're like the coin that never gets found because it doesn't want to be found. They're like the, the son that stayed home but had no love for his father. Guys, Jesus is trying to teach each one of us something. Don't leave the father. Amen. Amen. Amen.